this is Professor Joel Fult. Good. See, I got it this time. Yes. And so I found him on the internet. <laughs> Very sophisticated. Yeah. Many years ago, and asked him if he would be interested in meeting with our students and kind of talking. His specialty is religious studies and you do art. Um, so he gracefully said yes and we had our students here uh, last year and it was great. And Daniela and I have a question that we've been pondering since your lecture that we will ask later. We've been like struggling and trying to figure it out and so, um, I probably won't be able to answer, but you can. <laughs> you, will, you will. You <laughs> will. So, um, one of the things that I thought would be good to start off with, uh, we'll start off with having you talk about some of the things that have st stuck with you throughout this course, um, things that you've learned, and then we would um, expand with. Professor Jolto's knowledge, and then we'll do questions and answers. Um, and so, how does that sound? Perfect. That's what Excellent. I so, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. I told him we have a question for him that we've been pondering okay. over the past year. Okay. May I sit here? So, I'd like to open it up and kind of have individuals talk about some of the things that stuck with you throughout the courses, the lectures, the process um, in the U.S. in our course. So who would like to start? What is your experience hearing all of this? And hmm. A lot of different topics, actually. A lot of interesting topics. And since I'm not a psychotherapy or psychology, I probably won't be very helpful to you when it comes to, to that part. But, uh, but we can discuss the other part, the religious part, the theological part. And I just want to say at the very beginning that many of my views are not really terribly conventional. Uh, so I'll tell you sometimes, you know, this is what uh, we can discuss, what particular Christian, for example, religious traditions teach, and then I can tell you what I think about it, or what is my view, or why I disagree with some of the traditional stuff and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, do you have a more specific question to start with? <laughs> Daniel and I await till the end to ask our question. Okay, okay. But tell us your experiences with many of the topics and the thoughts and the conflicts that people have religiously, spiritually, that you've heard so far. And okay, you're let, let's take uh, the conflict uh, part. I mean, people usually have this tendency, historically also, to uh, have this idea that uh, harmony somehow uh, should be or is divinely inspired and conflicts and uh, you know people hating each other or killing each other or stuff like that uh, must be then uh, you know demon inspired or satan inspired and stuff like that uh, i mean if you think a little bit about that uh, we must be very careful because there is a, uh, i mean it goes back to the problem of uh, uh, theodicy you know justification of god in the presence of evil you know how can you justify the existence of a good god and the fundamental problem there is that uh, monotheistic religions have this problem. Uh, polytheistic religions usually don't. If you think about uh, polytheistic religions of the ancient world, you don't have a single figure that's in charge of evil. Think of Greek mythology, think of Roman mythology, think of uh, whatever you want. Uh, monotheistic theology do have that problem. And the problem is a simple one. If you have just one god, and there is evil out there, how do we reconcile the two? And you certainly don't want to be stuck with one evil God, right? Uh, so then you need to come up with some solution to that problem. And historically, when you look at the Old Testament, the idea of Satan as an evil uh, counterpart of God, 
actually came pretty late in the Old Testament history. You have figure of Satan earlier, but he mostly appears as kind of one on, you know, one personality on God's court. Uh, take the book of Job, for example, when, you know, at the beginning of the book, you know, they sit and chat like, you know, morning coffee, you know, and then like, Satan <laughs> says like, oh, you know, there is that guy, Job, and, you know, he's faithful to you, but if you do something, and the guy says, okay, okay, do this, but don't go, you know, farther than that. And, uh, I mean, this tells you something about how the idea of evil actually evolved. And then finally, I mean, because of the political uh, reasons and because of the Babylonian slavery, uh, it uh, in the in the period of you know temple period, it uh, comes to to what we know as you know the standard uh, concept of Satan and evil and fallen angels and stuff like that. So the problem of the theodicy is there. Uh, another problem is just how do we deal with uh, ourselves? Because we tend, and, and morality is there, um, actually a big problem, you know, kind of uh, ethical standards and ethical norms. Because we all want to look good in our own eyes, <coughs> right? I mean, you really need to, I mean, it's a really serious pathological cases of people, for example, who do evil on purpose or who are just happy with, uh, with doing evil stuff, mm -hmm. you know. That's serious pathology. Normally, people don't do that. Even if you look at, you know, criminals or, you know, terrorist groups, they always have a, an ethical rationale. So you, they always, there is some good purpose attached to that. Nobody goes, for example, to wars just on, on the pretext, uh, which normally is in reality that let's just go for, you know, whatever there may be imperial aspirations. You always have some pretext that is good. You know, when Hitler invaded Poland, he didn't invade it just to, you know, invade Poland, but because, you know, fighting for freedom and liberating Germans <laughs> and stuff like that. So there is always this need to justify what we do, even when that what we do is, uh, you know, some kind of pretty shitty business. Because we need to look good in our own eyes and the eyes of the others, at least others we care about. And when you think then about these ideas of evil, then actually demons and, and, and you know, Satan and that comes pretty conveniently into the you know, picture. Because it is much easier to convince uh, demons than uh, you to, to accuse them of being uh, you know, the source of that evil, then actually to think about what we do. And you have the, the interesting case in the medieval tradition, you probably discussed also that during your course, uh, because they had to copy manuscripts by hand, and, uh, and they were terribly scared you know, of making mistakes. But of course you make mistakes when you copy these things. And then there was one demon exclusively in charge of that. So they would uh, accuse him because he was the one who would make them make mistakes when copying the sacred texts. And when you think about that, yeah, perfectly reasonable uh, explanation, except when you look at uh, the practicalities of that. What, what the heck is wrong with you? You're just like, you, you make mistakes. But it is very difficult to, to deal with this. And when it comes to more serious stuff, uh, uh, real conflicts, and uh, you know, nobody really wants to look at themselves as the source of evil. So my, you know, one conclusion would be, uh, you know, let's be careful about it. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, are there, you know, these other realities, because the truth is we should have some kind of intellectual modesty there, because we know very little about what the reality you know, looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, even when you go to hard sciences, you know, we, we, we discover more and more than we have no idea, you know, what, you know, what are the basic principles, for example, in physics. Um, so we should really, the reality is complex, but sometimes it's really not necessary to go into the stories of Satan in order to make sense of what we do. And uh, uh, every time when, you know, there is lack of love, I think there is uh, this room for some kind of <coughs> actions against other people or ourselves that uh, you can traditionally interpret as demonic, but probably they are just our incapacity to deal with ourselves or the others. Agreed. Very much agreed. Um, I get a lot of people, especially in the course, that'll come to me and say, 
you know, this is happening, do you think it's because of oppression or whatnot? And I'll say, well, it depends on how you look at it. I think you're just tired <laughs> or you're worn out or you're, you know, whatnot, or, you know, it could or could not be. And I think that's the piece of people wanting to box it. And yes, this is, now do I handle it? Or versus, yes, it's a possibility, how do I distinguish and, and where do we go with treatment and, and how we address it, right? Um, sometimes uh, another thing that's very common, for example, and I think we mentioned that last time, uh, in the monastic tradition, for example, because in monasteries you're supposed to kind of this introspection and think about what you do and what you think and da, 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 all of that. So there is a lot of this, uh, you know, encounters with angels or, or, or demons and then, you know, tests and stuff like that. And then there is always some, something very nice that you can find there, you know, experienced spiritual, you know, leaders, uh, church fathers or uh, you know, abbots in monasteries, you know, they are advice to some who kind of struggle with this and, you know, oh, you know, God sent me an angel or there is something. And then, you know, just like kind of common sense of this, you really think you are that important yes. that God, you know, intervenes. So sometimes it is really about just like, uh, uh, you really think, you know, God would, I mean, you know, much more simple terms, it's not like that, but like, do you really think you are so that special or that you know extraordinary that now the whole universe should kind of gravitate and and make you do something or not? Yes. Because and, and the, the the point of that is that sometimes and you certainly know that from your practice, many of these uh, mental you know disturbances or illnesses actually have to do with some kind of egotism, mass or not. Uh, just as very often uh, when you have the role of a victim, someone who's already a victim, mm -hmm. it's actually egotism that appears that way. And we know that also from, you know, you find that in family relations, you find that everywhere. And then it kind of needs a supplement, <coughs> it needs something to, to, to compensate for this reversal. Uh, so because egotism can be, you know, uh, oriented toward others, so that you dominate, but actually can be uh, reversed and can be this, this role of uh, victims that we very often find. And then also the uh, image of uh, an evil other can go very well with that. So because then you actually, the, the evil demon can serve both purposes. Mm -hmm. It's the one who actually tortures you, but at the same time you don't need to deal with the egotism because the evil one actually comes into play to supplement that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because one of the things when you were mentioning that I was thinking of is, well there are a couple things. One, I was thinking narcissism. You know, mm -hmm. for some of the people that are out there that aren't humble and say maybe, uh, you know, this is, this is my role, this is what I'm meant to do, such as clergy and things like that, or others, but then that the narcissism of I am the source, like that sort of piece, which is the ego, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that came to mind is that working in psychiatric hospitals for many years and seeing the theme of um, two delusions that tend to be the most themes present are religious and political. And that is the power. Because that goes hand in hand, right? Yes, yeah. right? But also, if I believe I'm Jesus Christ, if I believe that I know, you know, God and I have lunch with him and all of this sort of stuff, then that makes me powerful. So could it be a coping mechanism, <laughs> right? And so that goes back to what you said earlier of when people say, uh, oh, this is demonic, or this is, I murdered this person because of this, or I did this because of this, they're not taking responsibility, so they cope by saying something else external has taken me over versus, no, this is really me, I need to work on my morals. Mm -hmm. right? And that's that piece <laughs> of what is it? that we will flesh out in a lot of ways in our treatment, in our therapy sessions, right? 
So there was a concept that you talked about you and that I, I just loved and, and you talked about their, the creation of angels, the creation of Satan and the creation of demons um, and you kind of went along this path of how that has occurred from a Christianity sort of view. Would you be able to do that again? Well, I don't remember actually. <laughs> I can start anew and then. Uh, so, uh, what are you asking? What was the creation story? So, from what I believe, unless it was articles I read, but I remember, I think I recall you talking about how, like, you started off with the creation of the devil was actually by God. Um, Really? No. Okay, I then that was one of the uh, art, some of the articles I read, but there was something about that. No, I mean the, 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 the standard narrative is that you don't find in the Bible, so it's, it's later, uh, you find in the later books, but not in the Genesis, uh, the idea that uh, Satan or uh, you know these demons were just fallen angels, angels who disobeyed and, uh, you know, uh, fell from grace and, uh, you know, became, became kind of evil counterparts to God and his angels. And this is something that really probably has to do with just uh, you know the transition from what is in the scholarly literature known as the Yahwist period of the early Judaism that uh, you know shows some elements of polytheism, many of them uh, common to the Middle uh, Eastern uh, religions at that time. And then transition to monotheism. So how do you, how these, you know, children of God, you know, become angels, you know, his servants, and then just one God there. And then, as I said, how to make sense of evil, you know, who's the source of evil. Uh, but then later, Christian tradition was, uh, would actually develop you know, this much more, especially in the early centuries. And basically, uh, if you take seriously the concept of freedom, human freedom, you don't necessarily need uh, demons or Satan to accuse for, for evil. It's enough that human beings are free. And I don't know if you've read or how many of you read uh, The Grand Inquisitor, The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor. That's my always standard literature from uh, Brothers Karamazov Dostoevsky. So there is, uh, you know, somewhere like uh, after first third of the book, you can just read that. You can find it online. Uh, the Legend of the Grand Inquisitor, because there the central problem is really the problem of human freedom, and how seriously human freedom is treated in this case in Christian tradition, and how seriously do we take that concept? Because uh, very often it is. Uh, and, and that's a topic in Grand Inquisitor that God or Christ actually believes in human beings more than human beings believe in themselves mm -hmm. when it comes to the problem of the issue of freedom. Mm -hmm. If you're free, then actually that freedom is the limit of God, God's intervention. And if we're free, yeah, we are free to do evil stuff. We are free actually to question you know, divine uh, plan. We are free to question God. We are free to reject God. We are free to do, and, and this is actually the way how, you know, some of the mainstream Christian approaches to this topic treat it. So, in, and that, that is at the same time, and, and in this uh, sense, human freedom transcends freedom of all other created beings. <coughs> That's what would be, could be one of the explanations, what is, why, uh, you know, other, the rest of the creation doesn't possess that, that quality. Why a human being is considered as uh, the icon of God? Precisely because of the capacity of freedom, freedom and love. But in this case, uh, freedom is interesting because that can reconcile uh, the concept of one God and the presence of evil. So, like, you don't need necessarily to go. That's what I sometimes have jokingly say. It's enough to have human beings, you don't need to have demons. You know, it's bad enough. So. so, what is the Christian, from your perspective and your studies, what is the true definition of possession? 
Uh, it's actually hard to say uh, because uh, uh, there are so many different cases and uh, already mentioned in the New Testament and then later on practicing Christianity and many different uh, phenomena that you cover, you know, with that concept. And uh, if you just think, and, and especially it's, it becomes more difficult if you apply to some other non-Christian traditions. Because what you find, for example, in, in some of the South American traditions, especially recent, that the, 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 the concept of possession has a different meaning. So it's not necessarily something that is kind of invasion of an evil force inside of your soul or body or something. It is allowing an uh, alien entity, spiritual, to come to your body or your mind, whatever you want to call it, in order to perform a certain purpose. For example, to heal. So, uh, in this case, it, it fits, I mean, the me mechanics of, you know, entering and getting out are similar and you need a medium, you know, to assist you, but the purpose is very different. The purpose can be healing, the purpose can be experiencing something, so it can be positive, uh, 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 viewed as a, as a positive thing. On the other hand, in the Christian tradition, especially medieval, it's, it was just considered as, you know, people who are either, you know, lack faith or or on the contrary, and that especially goes for the monastic tradition, who actually are on the right path, that then demons come trying to, you know, stop them, to, you know, make them divert them and blah blah blah. Uh, or it can be, you know, kind of moral morally, you know, perverted uh, you know, people who actually don't follow what is the right path and then they fall and stuff like that. So there are, there are different uh, functions that possessions can, can perform. And, uh, uh, but generally, I mean, if we would try to find a common definition for all these different cases, that would be, uh, let's call it an invasion of an unknown spiritual, with or without quotation marks, uh, entity inside your body, your mind, your soul, whatever you choose there, because these concepts are also something we should be careful about. Because very often when we think nowadays about a body versus spirit or body versus soul, that's um, very often not something that you can apply to, to at least the early Christian tradition. Um, and certainly not to the biblical tradition, because those concepts, soul and body, um, are, for example, in the Old Testament, used uh, almost synonyms. I mean, soul just means life. So then we should be careful, we should be asking, okay, which part of us, if we want to use kind of later medieval conceptualization, is invaded by, by the force. Uh, if you go back to Hollywood movies, then uh, you would say, well, it's kind of both some kind of mind and body and uh, stuff like that. But I like those movies that make those. But it's it's always uh, yeah it's kind of bizarre but it's uh, it's uh, it's it, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> so this leads me into uh, a little bit of Daniela and I's question, <laughs> which is according to Christianity, what happens when we die? Oh. Well, okay, an easy question, right? Um, okay, well, uh, there are different answers to that question in Christian tradition. Uh, very different answers, up to the point that it is actually impossible to, to, to find common ground. And that was a very important remark at the beginning that different Christian traditions really, not only they are different uh, among themselves, but, but within one single tradition you find very different answers to some of these basic questions. Uh, so for example, the concept of some souls, you know, that you know, go somewhere and then whatever, wander around uh, unspecified amount of time, uh, or go to heaven and hell and stuff like that. I mean, that belongs to a later uh, medieval Christian imagination. Uh, and there, of course, the problem is real, uh, but it has to do with uh, the concept of a uh, human being, human life, you know, what is, what is that life we have, 
and what is death in that respect. And of course it has to do with the broader picture that is really vital for the early Christian period, the New Testament tradition and, and immediately after, and that is what is called eschatology, eschatological expectations, meaning and things, you know, what, what comes at the end. Uh, and that is really, that was the real concern of uh, this first generation of Christians. Not life after death, not any of this stuff. It was their primary concern was Jesus is coming. Let's get ready for that. And they expected him to come back in not like in, in 5,000 years, but like very soon. Uh, maybe next week, maybe in a month, maybe, yeah, <laughs> but that was the expectation. So, yeah, like, they, they, let's, let's, you know, get ready, let's uh, get prepared for what's coming, and what's coming is the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God means the end of this world, beginning of a new existence, existence which will be, which will be found on, on love. And that will be the, the crucial distinction between this world and the world that is coming. Uh, so that was the primary concern, uh, not, you know, what happens when you die. Because in that, if you look from that perspective, really biological death doesn't mean much. I mean, it means much in the sense, yes, you're separated from the person you love, but it doesn't mean much from this perspective as the final, you know, thing, because you are not looking at this existence as something that has the fullness of, of life mm -hmm. and reality. Mm -hmm. So from this perspective, I think I, I, I actually, and it's, I mean, it's nice maybe to try to think about it. I think I, I was drawing the similar thing. Okay. Uh, if you think of history, and this is kind of, no, no, uh, and, and this is kind of biblical understanding of history, starting with Old Testament. So there is the moment of beginning, and then there is uh, the arrow of time, and this comes toward, is approaching some, some end. In the Old Testament history, that end was not kind of permanent end, but was uh, either re-establishing uh, the kingdom of the ancient Israel or something like that, prophetic tradition, so for Christians, this be becomes uh, history from the beginning creation till the kingdom of God. That means the second coming of Christ. But the idea is this one. Here, in this coming kingdom of God, which is not still not here, judging uh, by our <coughs> standards of time and reality, but that is true reality for Christians. Try to think about it. It's a pretty strange concept. It's pretty radical. That means that here and now, we are not fully who we are. We are fully who we are here. And how do you get there? Well, it kind of, it's coming to you, but you are, so the Kingdom of God as such, as, as, as a manifest reality, will come as an objective event at the end of time as we know it. But we are at the same time on our way toward the kingdom. We are manifesting it in a certain way, so we are making it present even in history. And that's through the acts of faith and love. Because if you think about it, I think I, I talked about that uh, last time, if you think about Apostle Paul's definition of faith, faith is really, let's see. Uh, faith in, for Apostle Paul, he, he defines it as giving literally in Greek, giving substance to the things unseen. So that means giving reality, giving being to things that we can't really see and touch and experience as real. And that is why faith, from a Christian perspective, is important. Because faith is manifesting, giving substance to something already here and now. What is that substance? Where that substance is this eschatological, something that, that is at the end. So through faith, it's becoming present already now. 
So that's why faith, from a Christian perspective, is not something like, uh, uh, oh, I believe, you know, a certain narrative. It is, it is something that has to do with uh, who we are, how we exist. And that is why this faith is uh, crucial, because it is at the same time an expression of freedom. Because there is no uh, any kind of necessity attached to it. You can't be forced, you can't be forced to things, to believe something unless you decide to be exposed to a certain narrative and then, you know, just, you know. But it's again, it's your decision and you can't be forced to love. But when, for, from a Christian perspective, it's, it comes to the same thing. Because uh, love is manifestation of this faith. And it is possible both of them just because of freedom. So kind of you get it three in one. Uh, it's uh, you can't have freedom and you, you can't have faith and you can't have love without freedom. And both of them are affirmation freedom. Mm. So this is why an act of, of, of faith is an act of bringing the eschatological reality uh, here and now, and there is absolutely no, no necessity attached to it in the sense that, you know, that's the beautiful thing about faith. You can't prove it. And that is important because if you could prove something, it wouldn't be faith anymore. So that's why, why the idea that, you know, oh, we should believe, or, or all those stupidities, you know, that you find in many of these, I don't know, history channel or something, uh, that, that you find saying, Things like, oh, you know, and how do you prove, you know, and then Christians who are actually trying to, to go and look at some scientific uh, proofs that, you know, something had happened, you know, a long time ago or whatever. It's, 